Hi there, welcome. Welcome to Home Keepers. Come right on in. Isn't this always the favorite room in the house? The kitchen? Of course it is. I think most of the times the kitchen is what sells the house um, to the lady of the house. I'm so glad you're there because I, I'm going to present to you a guest that uh, his story is spine tingling. His name is Evangelist Ricky Leonard. He was here a few days ago. I sat down and talked to him. And if you ever want to hear a story of the unbelievable, miraculous power of God in someone's life, Evangelist uh, Ricky Leonard is going to tell it to you in a few minutes. Um, but right now, we've got to move along because the interview is a little bit long. And Stephanie is here. <laughs> Hi, Steph. I was told to do my walk on. No. <laughs> Were you that ever the beauty pageant? No. You look like you should no. be. We're going, to, we're going to make a cheesy squash casserole. Squash. Squash. <laughs> and, uh, squash. We're going to make a cheesy squash. I have, I've mentioned before that my favorite thing are these vegetable dishes. Yes. I don't buy, I don't meet, buy meat twice a month, actually. I just really? don't care for it. Uh -huh. I like chicken, so I buy a lot of chicken. And uh, so th this kind of recipe really gets me excited. These are the ones you take to your church dinners and all, of course. So. Yes. Okay, so I have oil and butter in here. You're finishing chopping a mm -hmm. squash, a yellow squash. Yeah. I'm going to put some onions in here and get these um, going now that the pan is getting hot. And we like to just saute these a little bit because um, I like them crunchy even if they bake. Yeah, you can, you can actually put them in the oven from raw. Mm -hmm. They just it takes it just takes longer, mm -hmm. but this has some wonderful flavors in it, and so uh, you want to you want to start it out this way. Yes, and then so we have onions, we have butter and oil, we have squash, we have um, cheddar cheese, parmesan, parmesan cheese, cheese, sour, sour cream, cream, salt and pepper. So yes. you want to put the you want to put the squash in here. You know, uh, my sister was here last week. And yes, she wore you out. She did. <laughs> Look at that. I'm telling you, it's far more exhausting to go have fun than it is to... <laughs> to work? <laughs> just come to work. <laughs> you want to give me those, too? Mm -hmm. Well, we... Yeah, I feel like we haven't taped in forever. My fans are getting angry, you know. They're yes. getting a little testy. Yeah, because uh, summer vacations and all, mm -hmm. uh, we've been in some re-airs, and that doesn't bother me one bit it because bar bar as we are talking rippy. right now, somewhere around the world, people are watching I Love Lucy. Yes. That's, True those are reruns. Those True are reruns. So we do that once in a while. And and it's been raining like crazy here. Like, we're just going to float away soon if it doesn't stop. Yeah, but the fans are it angry because lethargic. you were not in the old program. That's true. Yeah. Yep. And they're, they're, they're emailing raging. me and they want to know. And it's not just my mom. It's really, <laughs> it's other people. No. <laughs> <laughs> You're, it's your aunt although, up there in Tennessee, Although too. my mom did email me and said, when are you going to be back out? I said, soon. We're doing a lot of shows this week. So mm -hmm. soon yeah. and very just, soon. Be patient Just because be patient. she's, I'm she's back. here. No. <laughs> she's here for good. Well, a little salt I don't and pepper. For good. <laughs> so we'll do a little salt and pepper. Do, do you want, want to spray the pan that you do so well? Mm -hmm. Well, it's always wonderful to have your relatives come and visit, you know? Oh, yes. She, and your uh, sister, I bet you guys just have so much fun. Yeah, I have another sister, the three of us. Yeah, she was the one that last week I was in the kitchen mm -hmm. upstairs doing something, and she came by and she goes, oh, there's Arthelene, and she thought I was you. <laughs> My yeah. own sister. Your own very own sister. Well, I noticed she was grabbing her glasses a lot. You yes, know, well, I was just glad that she thought this body looked <laughs> like this little body. <laughs> That's all I was happy yeah. about. Do you want me to start yes, putting some of ahead. this in? You could, you really could saute this for a little bit longer, but we're speed cooking today, so. Yeah, and it'll work either way. Here's yep, so this is sour cream. sour cream. It's cheddar cheese or sharp cheddar cheese and Parmesan cheese. I love mm. vegetables. I tell you, when I check out the groceries, it's mostly produce. There we go. You're a good healthy shopper. And uh, we'll pull this out and see how it's looking. Okay, and then all I'm going to do is put this in the sprayed pan, and then we're going to bake it. Super duper easy, super tasty, pretty healthy. And a sleeve of oh yeah, Ritz a crackers. The Ritz crackers right over the top. That you um, just crumble them you up just good. Just beat them. Mm -hmm. 
And we've already crumbled these, yes. but you take this and just put it right in the sleeve. Just get rid of some of your aggressions. Uh-huh. Oh, this is I haven't bubbling. eaten lunch yet, so I'm really, really ha happy this about is, trying this, this. This is a great lunch, really. And our this next show is um, my dessert for the day, so. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. Okay. I, I tasted this a while ago. And it, you did? It's very hot. Wait, be careful. Uh, it is very hot. <laughs> and how are you doing it's today? It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. It is good. Oh, that is so good. Mm -hmm. But let it cool off just a little bit, maybe, for you. <laughs> and um, inhale it. Boy, I'm telling you, it's it's practically a meal. It would be for me, but yeah, I'm gonna. That's gonna be my lunch. So uh -huh. let's go. We got to mm -hmm. go because I'm hungry. Mm. Okay, so I put these in here. I'm just putting um, Ritz crackers over the top. Oh, it's delicious. It really, really mm. is. And then we're just gonna bake it. I'm not kidding. That's one of the best things we've made in a long time. Okay, that's it. <laughs> That's it, yep, look, yep, Ritz crackers. So if you want a copy of this uh, recipe, you can email me or write to me. We'll give it to you, no cost I'll whatsoever. throw it up on my fan page, uh -huh. too. Be glad to get it out to you. And um, if you don't have a computer, like we usually say, just write to me. Uh, but now, uh, stay tuned, stay with us. I want you to meet this wonderful evangelist. His name is Ricky Leonard. You're going to love him. You're going to love his story because our God is great. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, just write to the address on your screen, or you can email your request to artheline at rippy.org. I want to welcome you to Home Keepers. Thank you. I understand that we were on shows back in the 80s. <laughs> yeah, a long time ago, yeah. When I had hair on my head. Uh, well, I, your story just uh, is stunning because I always think of it this way. I'm a church kid and wouldn't take anything for it. I cut my teeth on the pews and all. Yeah. But it's people like your story that gives that transformation that absolute regeneration that I'm not sure that church kids ever really encounter right on. yeah uh, so God saved you but he kept me so that is, listen that that's a powerful testimony it in is. itself that God kept you I want the viewers to know your story though I just uh, have gone over it and over it and the undeniable power of God uh, taking you from where you were to where you are now. Now, you were raised in a circus family? I was born on a circus, uh, Mills Brothers Circus in 1953. My mother went into labor when they were traveling through Arkansas, and the nearest hospital was in Arkadelphia. So that's where I was born. And what was that like? Were you on the road a lot? Yeah, uh, quite a bit, uh, about nine months a year, eight or nine months a year. and. Uh, different town every day, every two days. So I did a lot of traveling. It covered the whole United States eventually. Yeah, uh, what kind of performers were they? My dad uh, actually ran away from home as a boy and joined a circus. I've always heard of and, stories and, like that. In 1916, he was 15 years old, and uh, he joined a circus and he ended up being the chauffeur for the circus owner. That's back when they traveled by train, uh -huh. the Hagenbeck Wallace Circus. And he would drive the car off the train and, and show for the man around and do errands and things. And, but he ended up uh, doing one, actually, act called Roman Riding. And you might have seen that in the Ben-Hur movie. He would stand up on the back of six horses and race them around the track. Oh, my word. And then they uh, would do these cowboy and Indian shootouts back in the, in the 40s and 50s. And they had real Indians on the circus. And uh, they were looking for work like everybody else was back then. And uh, so they would do these wagon train things where they would race the, the stagecoach or the wagon around the circus tent and the Indians were chasing them and they would fall off the horse and get back on the horse. And Did you learn to stand on a horse? And uh, My mother trained horses uh, and trained dogs. She would get dogs from a pound and train them. And uh, so I learned a lot about animals and training horses, uh, trained elephants, did all sorts of things like that. Did you like perform? That. I did not. No, I, I. You said you scooped up poop. <laughs> yeah, I. Well, that's a 
Somebody sure. has to do it. Yes, yeah, somebody has to do it. Well, I most, mostly worked on, well, I was a candy butcher, they call them. I sold cotton candy, popcorn, peanuts. That's really where the money's at. Unless you're a top performer and making a lot of money, mm -hmm. the average performer doesn't make that much. Uh, but as a, as a candy butcher, I made pretty good money, and I put myself through school and paid for all my books and bicycles and everything yeah, else. How did, your how did you get your education? Did well, you my first year, I was actually taught, my first half a year, I was actually taught by a clown. And that, that kind of explains why I ended up the way I did. <laughs> uh, he was a certified teacher and taught several of the kids on the circus lot. And then after that, my mother took me off the road during school time, mm -hmm. and I went to school in Tampa. And uh, my mother stayed home to, to help me get through school. But every summer I would go back out in a circus and I'd spend the summer on the circus. You liked that life? I did. I loved it. I, I was, you know, grew up in it, so I loved it. Now, there, w there was no Christian influence, I understand. That at a pretty early age, you kind of got on the wrong track. Yeah, looking back on my life, it, it's really odd. There were a lot of religious people on the circus, you know, that had crucifixes and different oh. religious things that they prayed to. But I can't ever remember one real Christian or anybody witnessing to me. And uh, back in the 60s, I became a hippie. Mm -hmm. And I uh, used to, when I was still in school over in Tampa, going to Tampa Bay Tech, uh, I started selling drugs and, and around a lot of bikers and drug people. And I was never a biker, but uh, got into that whole thing and did drugs for several years. And finally, it just took its toll on me. And I just went off the deep end. I just went whacked out. Uh, you know, you hear about a lot of these shootings today, unprovoked, somebody walking into theater and shooting people. I was in that same frame of mind. You think that's usually got some drugs? I, I, it had something it. to do with it, yeah. But it, it more than that, it affected my brain. You know, there's only two forces in the world, Arthur yeah. There's There's God and there's a devil. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in control, guess who is? The devil's in control of you. I don't care if you're drunk, if you're on prescription drugs, or illegal drugs, whatever. And so and the you devil, mixed that with guns. So I had a gun collection, which was kind of scary. I had a lot of illegal guns. I had machine guns, sawed-off shotguns. Where in the world did you get a machine also, gun? Well, when you're around a lot of people that are doing illegal stuff, you can swap and buy and trade yeah. pretty easily. And I had several machine guns. I had one of these old Thompson machine guns with a, with a wooden handle, like they show in these old George Raff movies. Uh, but I started getting paranoid and... and strange acting and, and it stayed away from people pretty much and uh, I started carrying these guns in my car and I thought people were out to hurt me they were out to take my stuff I was very paranoid and if I got in an altercation with somebody I just took out a gun and shot them mm -hmm. shot their car up shot their house up and people asked me several times did you kill anybody <laughs> you know I didn't stick around <laughs> and uh, through this whole ordeal before the age of 20 years old I was shot three times and, and, and you did get in a shootout in Clearwater. In Clearwater in 1974. And a, a cop shot you, right? Right. I, a cop was chasing me through the streets of Clearwater. Uh, I ran through a roadblock they had. And uh, I, the cop said, I just stopped right in an intersection and got out of my car calmly and started blasting his car with a shotgun. And he was able, to, thank God, to open his door and dive out on the street. He wasn't hit. Mm -hmm. But uh, he said, when I stopped shooting, uh, I blew all the glass out of his car, holes all in the door. It was a real mess. And uh, he jumped on the hood of his car and began shooting at me and hit me in the back of the head with a 38 caliber hollow point bullet, a police special hollow point bullet. That bullet explodes on impact. So I had a hole in the back of my head about this big right here, and it's all plastic now. They put a bunch of silly putty there to keep my brains from falling out. And that left you with some paralysis, some seizures, I, I was brain damage. actually dead at the hospital and they revived me, operated for more than seven hours at Morton Plant Hospital, taking lead and bone out of my brain three inches deep, splattered in all different directions. And the doctor called my mother in Tampa and he said, I've got your son here, but I don't expect him to live. But God and had a purpose for my life. He did, and I want to move ahead a little bit to that, but suffice it to say that when you were somehow put back together slightly, they just dump you in jail. They just dumped me in a prison cell. They took me to court. I didn't even know what day it was most of the time. I was, my brain was messed up. Were, you were in a wheelchair? I had, no, I was, I had these crutches you strap on your arm. Oh yeah. And uh, with elbow pads and I would lock my arm. My right side was paralyzed. My eyesight was messed up. My eyes wouldn't focus. I had severe headaches. I had seizures every day for four and a half years. And 
thank God for prison ministries. They are the most unheralded, but there's yes. always someone there. I, I interviewed Murph the Surf once, I'm sure you know. Who I was in prison with Jack uh, yeah. in Zephyr Hills. And uh, when, the Christians would come in every week to witness, and yeah. he thought, what? What a bunch of idiots, you know, yeah. they could be at the beach, they could be here. But he said they kept coming and they kept coming right. and they kept. And so uh, a young Christian that if we knew your story and heard it like I have, um, that probably didn't have all the uh, rapport in the world, right. but he witnessed to you in a rather bombastic way. And eventually you received the Lord. I did, yes. Uh, at Arcadia, Florida at the prison down there in DeSoto Correction Institution. I received the Lord in 1975, and I got such a hunger for the Bible, I could not stop reading it. I just, I would get headaches, my eyes would swell up and tear up, and I'd get a pounding headache, and I'd stop for a while, and I'd start reading again. And I, I'd never been to a church in my life, so I didn't know how this Christian thing worked. I just started talking to God, and I would ask him questions. What does this mean? Uh, explain this to me. And he would just begin to share things with me, and and so I got a real teaching straight from the Lord in, in prison. And you, you're sitting there, clothed and in your right mind. Uh, there had to be a healing somewhere. Somebody's walking on crutches and have the back of their head blown off and seizures and all, and you look pretty good. I was in the same medical condition, as I said, for four and a half years. And in 1979, I was transferred to Zephyr Hills Prison. Actually, I was there in 78. So I was there about a year, and I was made a chaplain's assistant. So now I'm growing a little bit spiritually. I was leading Bible studies and prayer meetings, but I'm still in the fame, same physical condition. Every two or three times a week, I would fall out in the prison, have a seizure or black out. They would drag me to the medical clinic. When I woke up, right back to the dormitory again. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day I was in the chapel and I was doing a, a Bible study from Dr. Gordon Lindsay mm -hmm. about the life and teachings of Jesus. And it talked about the miracles Jesus did. He healed the sick, cast out demons, raised the dead. And one of the references went over to Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And I was thinking with my lightning fast half a brain, if he's never changed and he did miracles, he can do a miracle for me. Mm -hmm. And at that very moment, two prisoners came in and one man said, you don't know me. I was just transferred here two days ago and I've been fasting and praying and I saw a vision of a man who was crippled and God said, you're that man. I believe that if you'll pray and Tim and I agree with you, God will heal you. He said, do you believe that? And as soon as he said that, all that scripture I read began to come back to me. And I said, yes, I believe Jesus can heal me right now. And I just prayed a simple prayer. These two brothers agreed with me. I just said, God, I'm sick of being sick, taking pills and shots and capsules and being in a hospital. I said, you demon of epilepsy, I rebuke you. I believe that Jesus Christ is my healer right now. And when I finished that prayer at five o'clock, they blow a whistle in the prison and you have five minutes to get to your dormitory to be counted. When they blew that whistle, I threw my crutches on the ground and I ran out the door, ran down yes. the street in the prison. My right leg had atrophied to more than two inches. It grew out immediately. Eyesight came back, Ooh. headaches disappeared. I was completely made whole at that moment. And of course, I've got all the medical records, the police records to back this up. It's been on the 700 Club and many other programs around the world. Yes, if you just joined us, I'm talking to evangelist uh, Ricky Leonard. We're going to get that website up, and you can go there and, and hear the entire uh, testimony, which I tell you, the world needs to hear. They need to hear about that transformation that Jesus can do. Now, you were sentenced to 30 years. I was. And this lady in California starts writing to you. Yeah, it's kind of a long story, but I will, we'll shorten it up here. Uh, I started writing this girl in California who had just gotten saved through Campus Crusade. And she was going to college in Riverside, California. And uh, we started writing back and forth and fell in love in the mail. And I said, now, Lord, listen, you know how to complicate somebody's life. <laughs> We're 3,000 miles apart. I'm doing 30 years in prison. There's no way this is going to work out. And in Florida, of course, you can't be married in prison. California, you can, but not in Florida. So I'm thinking, how is this going to work out? Well, right after I got healed, I wrote this girl a letter, and I said, God just healed me. And she said, of what? And I realized I'd never even told her, what because what difference were. does it make? You know, yeah. we're never going to meet. So I started sharing that with her, and of course, it, it blew her little campus crusade mind. You know, she'd never heard anything like that. And uh, in uh, 
October of 1979, she came down to see me personally. And we visited two weekends in a row. She went back home and told her mother, I'm moving to Florida and help pray that man out of prison. <laughs> you know, this, somebody ought to make a movie out of this, really. And <clears throat> long story short, she did. You she got did. out within seven years of a 30-year sentence. Right. right. I, I got a letter from the state of Florida. I'm busy with, because of my healing, a revival broke out in that prison. Mm -hmm. I mean, people were getting saved, slain in the spirit. That'll do it. Miracles were happening all over the prison. Mm -hmm. And uh, one day I get a letter from the state, and they said, we've changed the way that we sentence people, and we've taken 15 years off your sentence. Well, there was another inmate there, Willie Dixon. I don't know if you've ever had him on a program, but he's awesome. Uh, he, he tells everybody he's my dad. He's a little black man, mm -hmm. lives in Tampa. But Willie did legal work in the prison. And Willie said, they made a mistake in your paperwork. I'm filing a writ for the whole prison. Well, I didn't even know what he was talking about. Uh -huh. I get a letter back, they're taking more years off my sentence. Then one day they said, we're taking you to Tampa Work Release Center. Well, they put me on a bus, they took me to the Work Release Center, and a man look, took one look at my paperwork and he said, you don't qualify for our program, what are you doing here? I said, mister, I didn't drive the bus, they dropped me off, you know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so they wouldn't put me out on a job, they gave me a toolbox, made me a plumber. I messed up all the plumbing, they gave me a tractor cutting grass outside, and I started a church service on Sunday at the Work Release Center, started preaching. And uh, I get another letter from the state of Florida, and they said, the guy said, I'm the second in command of the prison system. I never, I don't know if you remember me, but I've never seen anything like, like the miracles I'm seeing. My church doesn't preach that. Mm -hmm. But he said, I talked to the head man about you yesterday, and I have a note here saying you go home in two weeks. And they got married. So five weeks later, we got married in Hillsborough State Park. We didn't have any money, didn't have any sense. But we were in love, and we still are. We're still crazy about each other. 34 yes. years. And, you know, I wanted, we're almost out of time, but I wanted them to really hear your testimony. Uh, people need to know that the power of God has never changed. Yes. It's still available. But then you, you did go into the ministry, and we'll have to fast forward a bit, but literally around the world. Yes. And uh, God called me to preach the gospel around the world, and I didn't know how to do that, so I just began to go. And I've been to like 30 like countries the disciples, now. wasn't it? Just took off. And... Uh, we have seen, Arthelene, every kind of miracle you can possibly imagine. We've had blind eyes open, AIDS, people with full-blown AIDS. They look like skeletons. Within 24 hours, they have flesh on their bones, a smile on their face. God has healed them. We've had people raised from the dead, every sort of miracle. I do crusades in jungle areas where other people don't want to go. Mm -hmm. we've, we've done crusades in Muslim areas. We've seen thousands of Muslims come to Christ. When their baby gets healed, they forget about Allah. Because <laughs> they, they prayed to Allah and nothing ever happened. They pray to Jesus and they get healed. Miracles. So I use miracles as God's calling card and God uses it everywhere. Um, and, and that's the way Jesus used them. Yes. Uh, but also when you go into those kind of countries and there's such poverty and a lot of sickness, yes. their faith is pretty simple, isn't it? Yes. They, they, they have two choices. They have the witch doctor uh -huh. or they have these Christians. Mm -hmm. That's it. So, and they've already tried the witch doctor. They've given them four chickens and two goats and the child's still sick. So we come along and tell them we're going to pray for them for free and God's going to heal them. Mm -hmm. I tell the chief of the village, listen, call all the sick people out here in your village right now. What are you going to do? I say, we're going to pray for them in the name of Jesus and he's going to heal them. They look at you like you're insane. Like what? You're going to do what? <laughs> God always heals people, always. Uh, <clears throat> we are just about out of time, but I did... Uh, notice one thing in your testimony that if you give a gift to the chief of the tribe, yes. they kind of opens the doors for you. And I gotta say, it's a pretty cheap gift. You give them a ballpoint we pen. We give them a ballpoint <laughs> pen, anything shiny, Whoa. anything unusual. Uh, I gave a guy a flashlight one time. My wife was with me. We were in Nigeria in the bush. And uh, this village elder, I gave him a little flashlight with a push button. Something that cost $2 here. Mm -hmm. They'd never seen one. He was so thrilled. He said, we are all Muslims, our whole tribe, but if you'll send people back next week to finish treating us medically like you did today, Praise we'll all become Christians. Oh, Ricky, we're out of time, but oh, thank you for what a wonderful, wonderful story that Americans need to hear. Yes. They, they really do. And all, I know there's a lot of poor people, but against other countries, they're very wealthy. And yes. All of those things, and they've gotten cold in their hearts toward the Lord. And if you uh, ever doubted one second what the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ can do for a person, you just heard it. Stay with me. I have a couple things to say before we have to say goodbye.
Arthelene would like you to keep the following information handy. You may contact Homekeepers by writing to Homekeepers, P.O. Box 6922, Clearwater, Florida, 33758, or go to www.rippy.org. Remember, we always enjoy hearing from our viewers, and we thank you for your support. Wow. I, I, I've I, been a Christian as long as I can remember, and uh, what, what a story. What a marvelous, marvelous account of in one life what God can do. I don't know what's going on in your life, but you can call out to God just like Ricky Leonard did. I, I thought it was interesting that he had absolutely no church experience, no church life, but he just read the scripture and he just started talking to God uh, like I'm talking to you. And I'm wondering, have you ever really talked to God? Have you ever prayed? Have you ever just realized that He loves you so much? He does have a plan for your life. And yet we go through life and only kind of use God as a fire bell, you know, we got problems here. But the older I get, the more I'm walking through life, I realize that He is absolutely interested in every single part of your life. You hear the term a lot, you know, the devil's in the details. That is not true. God is on, in the uh, details of your life. And he knows how to direct those in such a way as to get your attention. And if you think that you do not need God, I can promise you, there will come a time when you need him and you know that you do. The best thing is to walk with him every single day. Do, do you spend time with him? I get up every morning. The first thing I do is read some scripture and pray and pray for every member of my family. Just those things that the Lord puts on my heart. You know, it's the best thing I do every day. It's, it's, all, it's almost like... Uh, an insurance policy in starting the day out doesn't mean the day's going to be perfect. But when you start out the, the Lord, if you want him all day, you really do need to meet him in the morning. If you don't do that, I hope that you will begin that habit. It's a good one. And I hope you'll join me next time. Remembering there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you should miss a homekeeper's program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTN Programs and then on Homekeepers.